Shortly after I finished my PhD work at Penn, my wife and I moved to Pasadena, California, where I had a postdoc appointment at Caltech. We moved into an apartment house a short distance from the Caltech campus. The manager of the building was Joanne Stromwall, and her husband was Clarence Red Stromwall. Joanne's husband, Clarence Red Stromwall, was a few months away from retiring from the LAPD, where he had been a member of the famous Hat Squad. The exploits of the Hat Squad were so legendary that a TV series of the same name was produced, along with the 1996 Hollywood movie Mulholland Falls. Both TV series and the film included many exaggerations. In this video, I will describe the exploits without the ex exaggeration. The four members of the LAPD Hat Squad were from the left to right, Sergeant Clarence A. Red Stromwall, Officer Edward F. Benson, Officer Harold N. Crowder, and Sergeant Max Herman, who was the leader of the squad. They were impressive because of their size. All were over six feet tall, and the lightest member of the squad weighed 235 pounds. Collectively, they tipped the scales at more than half a ton. They wore identical snap-brim fedoras purchased from the old H&K Hatters on Main Street in Los Angeles. They also wore tailored single-breasted suits costing nearly a month's wages that were cut to allow for the revolvers that they carried on their hips. The squad began with Herman and Stromwell, who were assigned to the LAPD Robbery Division as partners in 1949 and were joined by Benson in the mid-1950s and then by Crowder in 1959. The Hat Squad remained active into the early 1960s. Los Angeles was no stranger to organized crime in the 50s and 60s. However, the local mafia was small and the number of other gangsters such as Mick, Mickey Cohen was relatively small compared to big cities in the East and the Midwest. Unlike other LAPD squads, the Hat Squad's beat included the entire city of Los Angeles, and one of their important duties was to keep organized crime figures from other parts of the country out of Los Angeles. The squad often would receive word that one gangster or another from the East or the Midwest was on his way to LA, usually by train. The squad was the LAPD's welcoming committee for these out-of-town mobsters. When one of the wise guys stepped off the train at Union Station or off a plane at the airport, he would be greeted by the four members of the Hat Squad, who would suggest politely that it would be a good idea if the gangster turned around and headed elsewhere to do his business. Most of the time, the sight of a half ton of impeccably dressed LAPD brawn would be enough to convince the mobster to make a hasty retreat from the City of the Angels but occasionally a bit more persuading was necessary, but that was rare. The members of the squad were known to be strong, tough, gentle, and compassionate. Because of their size and demeanor, they seldom had to resort to force to accomplish their goals, but they were not afraid to use force if necessary. Because of this, they were widely respected by the local criminal element who understood that the game was up when the squad arrived to make an arrest. The members of the Hat Squad were extraordinarily intelligent. They had both street smarts and formal education. They understood that they needed to create an image and a mystique that would set them apart from the rest of the LAPD. The hats and the custom tailored suits were a part of that image, but there was more to it than that. In addition, they always traveled as a group of four in a single vehicle. Virtually everything they did was done as a group of four. They never deviated from that pattern, even though at the time other detectives worked alone or in pairs. When the Hat Squad was formed, there were only a handful of LAPD members who were licensed attorneys, fewer than 10 in the entire department. But it also was an era when the rights of criminal defendants were being expanded by the United States Supreme Court and the old techniques for solving crimes and gaining confessions no longer were available. 
Detectives needed to understand the new legal environment in detail in order to obtain convictions. The Hat Squad members understood this, and as a group, they, they attended Southwestern University School of Law, and three received law degrees and passed the notoriously tough California bar exam. So when the Hat Squad were assigned a case that had resisted solving previously, they had the skills needed to obtain convictions. The reputation of the squad grew to the point that often just having a case assigned to them was sufficient to have the culprit surrender. There were far too many notable Hat Squad exploits to describe them all in detail, but I will mention a few to give you a flavor of how they operated. First, they were not above having a bit of fun as they carried out their duties. The following is from a 1987 Los Angeles Times story about the squad. It was slightly past noon, a typical working day in the 1950s. A nondescript sedan pulled alongside a curb and parked on Hope Street in downtown Los Angeles. Four young, impe impeccably dressed men in dark tailor-made single-breasted suits, wide-brim hats, and polished shoes piled out and approached a hot dog stand. All were well over six feet tall and collectively they weighed more than half a ton. Momentarily, a Brinks armored truck appeared and rolled to a stop in front of a nearby business. The guards got out and went inside. As they emerged minutes later with a sack of money, they observed the four men at the hot dog stand looking toward the truck. Instinctively, the guards spun around and quickly retreated, disappearing inside. Well, one of the four said, it'll probably be about three minutes. As he had predicted, police cars' sirens wailing soon converged on the scene. The officers confronted the suspicious foursome, all munching hot dogs and enjoying a good laugh. It was not the first time this group had been mistaken for criminals, purely because of their size and dress. They were, in fact, detectives. Another incident involved a, a gang of criminals the four had chased through a hotel off of Temple Street. There were four guys and three gals. They ran out a side door to their parked car at the end of a cul-de-sac, maybe 50 yards away. They had rifles and handguns. In pursuit, Crowder took one side of the street, Herman and Benson the center, and Stromwell the other side. Like a scene out of the Old West, they approached in broad daylight, weapons holstered. According to Stromwell, when they saw us coming, they just put their rifles on the hood of their car and put their hands up. One of the squad's toughest cases took eight months to crack. The crime, which began as an abortive holdup of Moore's Incorporated, a discount store in West Los Angeles, occurred on July 29, 1960. It involved robbery, murder, and kidnapping. It involved both the FBI and the Hat Squad, with an FBI agent being assigned to each member of the Hat Squad. Ultimately, two parolees from Alcatraz were convicted and sentenced to the gas chamber, but neither was executed. One died on death row and the other was paroled and eventually ended up in a federal prison. Much of the credit for the convictions went to the Hat Squad, which had uncovered countless bits of evidence, including a gun that had been discarded in the desert. By then, Hat Squad members Herman Stromwell and Crowder had become attorneys, and their more sophisticated knowledge of the law pro proved extremely beneficial. That was about the time all these exclusionary rules became popular, Stromwell remembered, and we could foresee what was coming down the pike. 156 pieces of evidence went through trial on two separate occasions, and we didn't lose one of them. The Hat Squad was disbanded in 1963, 
when its leader, Sergeant Max Herman, left the department to practice law a few years short of the 20 years of service required to receive a pension. Herman became a very effective criminal defense lawyer in the Los, in the Los Angeles area and ultimately passed away of a heart attack in 1987. Squad member Benson had passed away in 1970. Crowder practiced law with Herman and two other partners in their own L.A. firm from 1967 to 1974 when he was appointed a municipal court commissioner. In 1985, Governor Duke Majin appointed him judge. Stromwell served briefly in the district attorney's office, became a commissioner of the municipal court, then was appointed judge in 1972 by Governor Ronald Reagan. In 1985, he was elevated to the Superior Court and he passed away in 1996 at age 72. And his wife, Joanne, whom, whom we remained in contact with over the years, passed away in 2004.